So I'd like to speak to you about the use of cloning and stem cells to uh, resurrect life. And as you know, uh, there are two ways to make copies of cells and organisms. The first and most controversial, of course, is cloning. And that is also known as somatic cell nuclear transfer. And the concept there is very simple. You start out with basically an empty egg. That's the large uh, circle here you see there. And then you place the cell you want to clone, the smaller somatic cell right next to it. And then you send an electrical charge through the unit. And what that does is it damages the membrane between the two. And the nucleus of the cell you want to clone dumps into that empty egg. Egg. And then what you do is you add some chemicals, you fool that unit into thinking it's fertilized, it starts to divide, and you end up with what's known as a pre-implantation embryo. And then you can do one of two things with that. You can place that in a Petri dish where you can turn that into embryonic stem cells, which are the master cells of the body, and they can turn into virtually every cell type. And then the other uh, alternative is, is you can place that into a surrogate animal to create an entire organism. Another approach that's newer is known as cell reprogramming, and that leads to what's known as induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPS cells. And what you do is you start out with a, a somatic cell or a piece of skin, you throw in some transcription factors, and bring that differentiated cell back to a state of pluripotency, very much like an embryonic stem cell. And we have new tricks now where we can actually turn those cells into an entire organism as well. So to date, uh, about two dozen different species have been cloned. Back in 1958, John Gordon actually cloned the first animal. That was a frog. In fact, he was just recognized for that feat uh, a few months ago with the Nobel Prize. And since that time, of course, has been Dolly the cloned sheep. And we and other groups have cloned mice and goats and even cats and dogs. In fact, back in the 1990s, uh, we actually cloned an entire herd of cows uh, from genetically modified cells. So what you actually see here are uh, animals that are making human albumin in their milk. So we could use that same approach to reconstruct extinct animals a la Jurassic Park. So in this case, we took a skin biopsy from the ear of a cow, we grew up the cells, knocked in a gene cassette, and then used ordinary eggs to create that herd of animals. So similarly, as George Church will describe, we can then take, say, an elephant cell, knock in the genes for tusks or long hair or even hemoglobin so it can live in a cold climate, and then using a technique that I'll describe later, we can then create sperm and eggs and, entire, and indeed an entire organism from that. So there are two types of cloning. One is known as is, uh, interspecies cloning, and the other is intraspecies. So with the interspecies, you actually use the, the egg and the cell from the same species you want to clone. But using this cross-species approach, we actually can take the egg of one species to clone the cell from another. And that's very important if you want to resurrect uh, extinct animals or if you want to clone endangered animals. So back in 2000, we actually used this cross-species technique to clone the first endangered species. In this case, it was a gower, which is a, a wild ox on the verge of extinction. And at the time, everyone said that, you know, that's not going to work, that's impossible. And the reason for that is, is that a clone isn't really entirely a clone. It turns out that every cell has two genomes. One is the mitochondrial genome, and the mitochondria are the, the organelles in the cell that make energy. And that's maternally inherited, so that will come from the egg. And then the other genome is the nuclear genome, and that's what contains the genes that distinguish you and I from an elephant or a mouse. So those two genomes have to talk to one another, and there's evidence that that can only occur with an 8 to 18 million years species radiation. And so we got around that problem by actually using very closely related species, concordant xenograft combinations. So in this particular case, we had a gower and a cow, and they are both in the Bose family. And so uh, using that approach, uh, we actually were able to uh, reconstruct these uh, cloned Gower embryos. They may look like just little circles to you, but these are actually beautiful little Gower blastocysts. And the idea here was is to, to, to create these embryos, send them by FedEx off to a farm in Iowa uh, where they would be implanted into some ordinary cows. And it turns out actually the first round that we made, we actually put it outside the door for the delivery truck guy to pick up. And unfortunately, when we came the next morning, they were still there. But eventually FedEx did deliver a new round of these embryos. They were indeed implanted into uh, some animals uh, out in Iowa, uh, Transover, and uh, we had actually a 25% pregnancy rate. Two of those uh, we let continue on to term. Unfortunately, one of those aborted late stage, at, I think it was 202 days. We let one of them continue to gestate, and here's Bessie at uh, eight months 
pregnant. We were a bit nervous. Uh, the whole world was following us. CNN was, was running it almost every day, and we were concerned, well, what if Bessie gave rice to an ordinary cow? That would be very embarrassing. So, uh, and that's happened before. So uh, fortunately, uh, it did give rise to a very beautiful little baby gower, a bit surreal, seeing this exotic endangered animal that's normally born in the bamboo jungles of Southeast Asia being born out in an Iowa farm that reeked of cow manure. But uh, it, it was alive died, unfortunately, two days later. Everyone said, see, Bob, the technology doesn't work. So went back about two years later. Uh, we approached the San Diego Zoo and, and, and Oliver, and they actually came up with uh, what's known as a an animal known as a bantang. Uh, only about 2,000 of these animals left on the planet. And he had cells from this animal that actually had been frozen away for a quarter of a century. So they sent us a, a vial of these frozen cells. And again, what we did is, is we, we put those into cow eggs, sent them back off to Ior, and Indeed, on April Fool's Day in 2003, we had a beautiful little baby Bantang that was born. It was ultimately transferred to the San Diego Zoo where it lived with the other Bantangs there. So this technology does work. Uh, there are some problems, but we have new technologies that I'll mention that can now solve many of those bottlenecks. So, I collect dinosaur fossils, so when you go through my front door, the first thing you see is this brontosaurus femur. It's about six feet long. It weighs 800 pounds, and everyone goes, Bob, you're going to clone it. And, and that animal was bigger than my house. I don't even know what the surrogate would be, although it is an egg. So in any case, uh, I actually live on an island, and one day a USA Today re reporter was here, there, and he says, well, you, you know, you have the island, you just need the electric fence. <laughs> and I told him, well, you can't clone from stone, so you're not likely to see any dinosaurs in your backyard anytime soon. But that doesn't mean extinction is necessarily forever. You just heard from Alberto about Sailor. Uh, so that was the first short-term success. Uh, and uh, actually, I remember back in 2000, going to Zaragoza, Spain, and meeting with them, and meeting with the ministers. And that was only a few months after Sailor had died. And we said we wanted to clone it. And they, they, they almost laughed and just basically said that that, that was science fiction. Uh, I actually still have a, a bottle of wine uh, from one of the ministers. And I'm waiting. I'm going to open it when the first bucados are released in the Pyrenees. So there are other species. Uh, Mike Archer uh, mentioned, uh, you know, the gastric brood and frog, uh, frozen cells. So hopefully we'll be able to resurrect that using the cross-species cloning. But those techniques are limited, as I, I mentioned. So recently, again, a few months ago, he shared the Nobel Prize with John Gordon, uh, uh, Dr. Yamanaka, uh, discovered iPS cells. These are the, rep the reprogrammed cells that I mentioned to you. In using that approach, uh, basically, we now have a new tool for conservation biology. So when uh, Yamanaka published his paper showing for the first time we could make human iPS cells, I published a letter in Science saying that this could also be used for conservation biology to, to restore genes from endangered and extinct animals. And that has been used successfully in some animals. Uh, I, there are many techniques. This is just one of them here. Uh, something known as tetraploid complementation. So what happens is you start with your fertilized egg. You let it divide to the two cell stage. And then you fuse those two cells so there's twice as much DNA in that. And that's what's called the tetraploid. And then you let that divide. And it continues to divide into uh, what's known as, as a blastocyst. And that will only go on, those tetraploids will only create the placenta and extraembryonic membranes. They will not create the embryo per se. So you can inject iPS cells into that blastocyst, and those will go on to become the animal. So you can start out with an embryo surrogate that's white, inject your iPS cells from a pigmented animal, and get all iPS animals, essentially clones. So we can do that, and we can make iPS cells from almost any animals. We made them from horses, we made them from avian species. Uh, so you can make them very readily, unlike uh, the normal cloning procedure. But the more likely way this is, is, is going to occur uh, is to actually just turn the iPS cells into eggs and sperm. So what you would do is you just have a little piece of skin from any endangered animal or, or a closely related, say, the mammoth, you could start with an elephant. You add the transcription factors, 
turn them into iPS cells, and then those can then be coaxed into primordial germ cells and then turned into either sperm or eggs. And indeed, that does work. A few months ago, for the first time, people, a group in Japan actually turned iPS cells into eggs that resulted in live pups. Uh, and a, a year before, the same group actually turned iPS cells into sperm that could actually create live pups as well. So the goal for these extinct species is simply, for instance, to start with like an elephant cell, upregulate the various genes for tusks along here, whatever, and then you just create sperm and eggs. And, uh, and then you create an entire organism. But just in case that doesn't work, and for those of you who are Jurassic Park fans, I actually have a piece of amber in my pocket, and it really does have a mosquito on it. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>